going to share this set. Did you mute your computer? Okay, so we have, um, so it's mine. I thought it's muted. Okay. Um, so the first speaker is Epley from ETH Zurich and the search for flat bands in Kagome metals. Great. Audible? Yeah, I guess it's audible. Okay. So it's a, it's a big uh, pleasure to be here. And I, I want to thank the organizers again for uh, uh, having this uh, marvelous meeting uh, that uh, uh, it seems to have started many, many years ago. And the topics uh, seem to have moved on uh, to, uh, uh, you know, starting, I guess, with heavy fermions of ITC. And now, now this time is dedicated uh, more to topological effects. And uh, I am going to talk about essentially a search for uh, a key ingredient of interesting uh, topological effects uh, in uh, a real, uh, real material. Um, let me just. Uh, why is this not advancing? Oh, there we are. Okay. It's funny that it doesn't. Uh, Uh, let me just uh, acknowledge uh, the, uh, my collaborators in advance. It's, it's always important, especially if you run out at the end. Uh, so uh, I've uh, highlighted here at the beginning of the list the, the junior people, uh, the postdocs uh, who've really uh, done uh, most of the uh, most of the work uh, on making this happen at a variety of institutions, uh, both uh, in uh, Switzerland, uh, including, of course, uh, ETH and EPFL, uh, but also University of, of Geneva. Uh, and the work uh, that I'll describe uh, is, is covered uh, in these uh, two uh, preprints, and there'll be a, another one uh, shortly uh, uh, dealing with uh, the end of the talk, if I manage to, to get there. Uh, so uh, just by way of outline, uh, I'm just going to tell you probably something you already know, just, just sort of briefly reintroduce the Kagame lattice and what can happen on the Kagame lattice with electrons and spins and why is it so interesting uh, for uh, the correlated electron community. Uh, I'll then just briefly uh, touch on, you know, what's being done with real materials, insulators and metals in, in the search for, for flat bands. And then I'll talk about the material, which is the main topic of uh, my, uh, my lecture today, uh, and then deal with electronic structure and uh, magnetic excitations uh, thereafter. Okay, so frustration, you all know uh, triangles are interesting uh, because you can, uh, if you have a third spin, let's say in the Ising model, uh, all coupled equally to each other. Uh, that one is frustrated, doesn't quite know what to do if you set the other two spins uh, in a particular uh, orientations. Uh, and of course, uh, these, uh, this gives rise to you know, sort of non-trivial geometric frustration on, on bigger lattices of triangles. So the triangles are the basic motif. And uh, of course, uh, you can decorate these uh, triangles uh, with spins. And uh, actually, uh, the other thing that you can do with the triangular lattice is you can thin it down, you can dilute it. And, and one thing actually that I'm sure you, you all know is, is that if, if you just remove, let's say, uh, if you remove one, one third of the spins to make a hexagonal lattice, actually, you, you're no longer frustrated. You can generate, you can create a, a lattice where uh, all spins actually are are, are happy. So uh, so playing around with the triangular lattice and its derivatives is is interesting. So in the case of going from the triangular lattice to the hexagonal lattice, uh, the dilution actually helps uh, relieve 
uh, their frustration. And, uh, but uh, there are other, uh, and so this is of course the simplest case of a vacancy lattice derived from the triangular lattice. Uh, uh, you can uh, of course uh, also have uh, more interesting uh, vacancy lattices than simply hexagonal, which we know so well from graphene these days. You can have a two by two vacancy lattice, and this actually gives rise to the Kagame lattice that actually maintains uh, some of the triangles. So there's frustration that is actually continues to exist. And uh, this uh, uh, thinning out uh, exercise uh, in this case, uh, you know, leaves you essentially. Uh, with uh, with a problem uh, for the simple Ising model, uh, but actually uh, you can relieve the frustration, of course, to some degree if you if you have uh, continuous spin degrees of freedom on on, on any of these lattices. Uh, but uh, what happens uh, with the Kagome is 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 especially interesting with this vacancy lattice. Uh, you have this opportunity here to create, let's say, some ordered structure, be it anti-ferromagnetic or ferromagnetic, where you actually maintain local degrees of freedom, uh, which uh, can uh, fluctuate at no cost to their environment. Okay, so, so what this effectively means is that in, in real space, you have these, these localized degrees of freedom, which, which essentially can rotate uh, in the presence of everything else uh, without any cost. And that, of course, leads to these famous uh, flat modes uh, that uh, are the topic of this particular uh, particular talk, and I think also suspect the topic of many other talks at this uh, meeting. Uh, just uh, if you want to read about this, this is, of course, a very old story. Uh, it's something that Premi Chandra and I wrote, uh, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, so moving into case space, how, how does this happen? So. If I look at the ferromagnetic spin waves in the honeycomb lattice, of course, those are, uh, have a very close relationship to the electrons uh, in graphene. Uh, you have uh, this uh, famous uh, dispersion uh, relation uh, with these uh, touching points, these, uh, uh, these Kagame type, uh, these uh, uh, Dirac nodes uh, at, the, at the K points of the, uh, of the, uh, of the honeycomb uh, lattice. So there's, uh, it, it, this, of course, is, is, has been uh, much discussed and has interesting for implications also, you know, when you think about uh, edge states and, and everything else, whether it's spins or electrons. Uh, if you, so there's two modes here, essentially, that touch. Now, if you, if you go to, this is the root three by root three uh, super lattice uh, of the, uh, of the uh, ordinary triangular lattice. Now, if you go to the Kagame, there's actually an extra mode that gets added in K space that corresponds is flat in K space corresponding to these localized degrees of freedom that I mentioned to you uh, a few minutes ago. And so you, you still get actually inherit essentially these Dirac, uh, these, these, the, the, uh, the, the, you inherit the hexagonal modes, including the Dirac points, which are marked by the green arrows, you inherit those. But you add, in addition to those Dirac modes, you also add a, a flat mode on top. And uh, these are just spin wave calculations. But uh, as you know, the, these are completely essentially just related by a simple square root uh, to what you see uh, for electrons. And uh, this uh, topic uh, of uh, what might happen in such lattices when you add correlations really came up. In a, in, a, in a serious way, uh, a little bit more than a decade ago in a, in a paper from uh, the group of uh, Xiao Wen uh, at MIT. And, and they, they started to try to tune these uh, dispersion surfaces that I just showed you uh, using uh, first and uh, second neighbor hoppings. They also uh, added the spin orbit coupling to make the physics a bit more interesting. And they also added uh, ferromagnetism. But basically with this tuning, uh, these modes here up here, uh, you see uh, the, the 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 ordinary Dirac type modes, or if you wish, the graphene type uh, modes. But they, of course, acquire uh, gaps 
uh, which which are which basically become uh, a function or a function of these these additional parameters that uh, are thrown in. Uh, there's also down here. There's this this uh, this originally uh, flat mode, uh, whose whose curvature uh, and and distance from these others uh, is can be essentially fixed by these uh, first and next nearest neighbor parameters uh, that I just illustrated uh, in the last slide. And uh, what we have here really is a metallic ferromagnet with a spin orbit uh, interaction. And it's of course interesting uh, at that time it was thought to be interesting because maybe this could be a uh, residency uh, for high temperature uh, fractional quantum Hall states uh, in zero field. And so uh, long story short, uh, here's a particular uh, tuning that they used. They got sort of, they introduced uh, flat bands in this simple lattice, Kagame lattice with the U. So these are potential hosts for exotic quantum pulse states. And in, in some sense, this is uh, not in some sense, in every sense, this, the motivation for this kind of work is exactly the same as a motivation for all of these wonderful studies of uh, twisted bilayer uh, graphene uh, that you've heard about for the last uh, five, six years, uh, especially from, from you know, the, the, the MIT and Columbia groups. So what about experiments to actually see these flat modes, actually to spectroscopically make sure that they're really there and that, that all of this theory based on very simple models is somehow relevant uh, for uh, you know, actual uh, physical measurements. Uh, it turns out actually that it's, it's rather uh, more difficult there. I mean, on the, on the insulator side, essentially uh, for the, the simple ferromagnetic Kagame uh, uh, systems, uh, the best data are available for this uh, horrible uh, organometallic thing with copper. It does have ideal, this copper uh, BDC, I can't pronounce that, benzene dicarboxylate, but I just did. Uh, those are the things that essentially are, are stuck uh, between these layers. You see the benzene rings there. Uh, and then there are these Kagame layers, which are actually quite perfect uh, for copper. Now, the unfortunate thing with this is, is that it's not possible to get really large crystals. And so all of the data that we have on this system, uh, uh, the dynamics of looking or looking in detail at the flat modes is uh, on powders. Now, that's that's an insulating realization that can just look at the, the magnetism. Uh, there's of course uh, metallic realizations and the most popular one uh, with the uh, sort of people uh, doing experiments has been this uh, iron, uh, iron three tin two, I, it's, mis, uh, it's misspelled there. Uh, and what, what this is, is uh, Kagame bilayers uh, with, with inner, interspersed with uh, Kagame bilayers of iron, add tin, interspersed with simple uh, tin uh, triangular layers, and then another Kagame bilayer on top, and so on and so, on and so forth. It gets uh, repeated. So this is a proposed metallic realization of this material. Uh, it, it's actually not quite as simple as, as that. Uh, in the sense that the Kagame layers, uh, these bilayers actually are, are actually distorted and, and they're distorted in such a way so that actually you, you lack uh, inversion symmetry uh, in the uh, in, in, uh, points of inversion symmetry, even in the plane. Uh, and the other drawback of this stuff is that the crystals are rather small, but you can get reasonably good uh, things sort of in the, in the sort of fractional uh, a fraction of a millimeter range. Uh, the, this stuff has been studied for a very long time. Actually, it's been studied you know, essentially uh, for the last 50 years. Uh, it was, it, it's curious. It has a very high ferromagnetic transition temperature. It's not 630K. So it's a very strongly coupled uh, sort of stoner type system, one thinks. It has a curiosity uh, that attracted most of the attention, which is it has a spin reorientation transition sort of at around 120 Kelvin, uh, where uh, the moments go from lying essentially perpendicular to the plane to in the plane. And uh, it, it turns out that uh, there's a uh, recently we've been able to establish there's a, a nice critical endpoint associated with that uh, transition. This is not the topic of this talk. 
uh, topic of this talk is, is really thinking about the dynamics, uh, uh, trying to see if we can see the, the flat modes uh, that are needed to get all this interesting many body physics. So what about the electron? So uh, we actually have uh, uh, performed the meaning, meaning the, the people from Oleg Yazev's uh, team in our collaboration uh, have uh, gone and, and calculated uh, using DFT, all kinds of parameters. Uh, I'll get to some of those later. And, and what you see is, is actually for, uh, is a band structure like this. It looks like any other band structure of a complicated material. Uh, there's actually in this, any DFT calculation that you look at has, bears no resemblance at all to the simple dispersions that I showed you at the beginning, uh, even the, the dispersions that uh, Xiaogong Wen uh, got when he expanded the hopping uh, range uh, to be to second nearest neighbor. So it's a fully three-dimensional metal. So that's a little bit sad. Uh, it's got an absolutely Baroque Fermi surface. So again, nothing at all like what uh, you were told to uh, believe. Uh, and uh, and and then uh, people, of course, did photo mission. And and uh, what I'm uh, trying to convey to you here uh, is is that uh, actually the photo mission is is uh, doesn't actually show very much of that spaghetti. Uh, the photo mission also has a drawback, especially as photo mission is usually performed, is that not only do you see the spaghetti from the bulk. You also see all kinds of uh, fill from the surface states, uh, particularly at the energies where people like to do photo emission, uh, which is uh, you know near you know is between fifty and one hundred eV, and and so there's there's some ghost like features, and and uh, a lot of time was spent uh, in the early days, meaning a few years ago, on on on, on looking near the K points. Of course, these are the same K points that are inherited from the hexagonal. Uh, lattice and triangular lattice, uh, and there's this feeling that well, there there are probably Dirac points there. Now, that what the calculations actually do show is that those so-called Dirac cones are are first of all they're not predicted by DFT for the bulk, but they're actually derived from the superposition of surface and bulk states. And so that's sort of the you know that's I'm happy to engage in more discussion about that, but that's basically a done deal. These the, there are no Dirac points here. The other thing is uh, there's no Nobody can see any flat bands there either. Uh, new discovery, which uh, there'll be, I think, a talk later in the meeting about, is is that although there are no Dirac points, there are tons and tons of wild nodes, which are very close to the Fermi surface. So uh, the other thing uh, thing to say is experimentally, uh, you know, there are these, although there are these features which have fooled people for a, a long time. Uh, there's there's no sign of well resolved quasi particles near the Fermi surface, and no sign of resolved flat bands anywhere. But there are curious features in the 3D band structure, which Arpes does see, and and they they're seen in action in a very ghost like way. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is essentially a photo mission. Uh, you of course all know that. Uh, with photo mission, you, you, you only conserve momentum in the plane, but of course you could always uh, fix uh, the uh, momentum along the Z direction for the initial state uh, by looking at the, the energy, uh, the outgoing electron energy. So you have a way actually to perform KZ scans by varying uh, the energy KZ where Z is perpendicular to the surface, or perpendicular to the basal planes of this material. You, you scan the, the photon energy into into the soft X-ray regime. So this is now hundreds of EV, and and so what I'm showing you at left is a section of the Fermi surface actually in the KY KZ plane. Okay. And what you see is 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 that there are actually curvatures there. There are band curvatures there. There's also uh, what's noticeable is is that uh, if you look near the uh, if you look uh, in detail and with some optimism near the gamma z points is is there looks like to be some uh, essentially a zone center Fermi surface uh, which is which is actually fully modulated uh, along z and you can make this out in this cut along this dash vertical dash line 
you can see here that there are alternating sort of dark and bright regions exactly at the Fermi surface, basically centered on the gamma and Z points. So that was just a, a very, very small hint. This is hardly definitive, but it said that, that perhaps uh, to, to look for, uh, we should try to finally see if we can actually image directly real quasi-particles near the Fermi surface by going into a different regime uh, with the instrumentation that's available for our fish. And uh, what we decided to do to, to try to see a little bit more in detail, particularly what goes on near the gamma points, uh, is, is we went to do laser ARPAs with a very low uh, initial uh, photon energy, just 6 eV. And, and of course, what that 6 eV means is that your typical kinetic energy uh, for the electrons, you have to subtract the work function with the electrons uh, from the photon energy is, is going to be measured in, in single digit EV. And, and the great thing about that is that the, at these low energy, the very low energies, the electron mean free path yeah, becomes uh, much longer. It's basically of order 100 angstroms or, or beyond. Uh, in contrast to what uh, that mean free path uh, was uh, in this regime uh, where I showed you uh, the uh, the photo emission data again, which misled people about these so-called uh, Dirac cones, and so we're now dealing with the uh, meat-free path for the electrons exiting the sample, uh, a good uh, more than an order of magnitude longer uh, than uh, than uh, we were dealing with in this in this uh, typical uh, soft uh, sort of uh, UV range that uh, people work in. Uh, the other thing that actually the laser brings, it brings a much smaller spot size than you get out of the normal uh, synchrotron source. So these two facts are, are very important. So the first thing, there are three things that you get. One thing is you get much more bulk sensitivity, so you don't have to spend all your time trying to sort surface from bulk. Uh, the other thing, it gives you uh, uh, specificity to particular locations in the sample. And of course, last but not least, it gives you much better energy resolution. So you really can start to look at quasi-particle lifetimes and mean-free paths. Uh, so uh, at the same time, of course, uh, one uh, needs to do uh, some uh, DFT to try to understand these pockets. And DFT does, in fact, give these pockets, DFT for the full three-dimensional material. These pockets don't exist in any kind of simple model calculation for the bilayers or the monolayers. And, and uh, the, the most important thing, I know this, I, unfortunately this uh, uh, screen is much smaller than I thought it would be. Uh, the key point uh, that, that we want to look at is uh, here uh, near, the, uh, near the gamma point. And what you'll notice is there are indeed electron pockets for the Fermi, uh, electron-like uh, Fermi surfaces centered on the gamma point a very small range of Q space and uh, a small range of uh, energy transfers, which is actually perfectly matched to the 6 eV incident energy that we uh, are using for this, uh, uh, this particular photo emission experiment. Now, the other interesting thing that the uh, uh, calculation, of course, reflects is the fact that there is no, uh, that there is actually a, a missing uh, inversion symmetry in the plane uh, for these real uh, real materials. Again, if you squint at this, and again, I, I'll show you a little bit more data later in a minute, is, is uh, depending, in fact, on, on how you, uh, uh, it, it, depending on, on uh, essentially uh, the orientation, let's say, of your experiment relative to the crystal, uh, you'll find that actually these uh, Fermi surfaces are not uh, inversion symmetric going to the gamma point. Okay, so that's, uh, and the last but not least is uh, what goes on near the gamma point is very, very sensitive to you in, a D, in the DFT plus U calculations which were performed here. And so uh, if somehow you can get your hands on these gamma points uh, in a clean way, you can actually decide, uh, determine uh, what you might be. This, this band minimum, uh, really moves very quite strongly. Mu of, uh, of uh, 1.3, for instance, the band minimum is, is something like uh, minus 0.1 eV below the Fermi surface. 
uh, and, and if, if U is a half, uh, then it's substantially lower around 0.3. So if you can, with high resolution, measure that band minimum, you can also establish a key parameter for the many body physics here, which is the, basically this, this, the U term uh, in a DFT plus U calculation. Okay, so now finally, uh, show you some data. So the data do not disappoint. These are now suddenly, when you do this experiment, uh, you sure enough, you actually resolve these features at the, uh, around the gamma points. And you see a nice, seemingly sort of circular thing, which has threefold, not sixfold symmetry. Okay, so it doesn't, doesn't invert. So if they rotate by 180 degrees, that pattern is not the same. Uh, the other thing that you see is you see uh, evidence that there are actually three bands there. There's the, and we would just label them alpha, beta, and gamma. And the minimum is minus 0.1 EV, which, which means now you could actually compare directly with the DFT plus U calculation and then isolate this, this U term. Uh, now, if you move the beam on the sample, actually you rotate this pattern. Okay, you rotate, rotate it, if you like, by 180 degrees, or if you wish, 60 degrees, which of course is, is equivalent to 180, uh, because it's of course a threefold symmetric uh, pattern. So what you can see here uh, at the top, you can see that, the, that this pattern uh, here is, is rotated or flipped through the origin. Also, if you look at the energy Q dispersion curve, it, it's simply also just simply flipped uh, around the origin. So this, this pattern here which is really crucial, is, is not symmetric uh, going through between the M and M, uh, between the M prime and M point. So uh, depending on where you are in the sample, you get a different uh, uh, looking uh, band structure, but it's always symmetry related uh, in the sense that the, there are two band structures that you see, which are simply rotated relative to each other by 180 degrees. Okay, so the twinning matters, yeah. Yeah. And now there are. And sure enough, I, I'll tell you in a minute. Yeah, that, that, that's the next topic. But uh, let me just do the, the material science housekeeping first, and then we can do the physics. So just on the material science side, uh, you could actually map out this crystal and essentially what's happening here is the crystal is twinned and and you have and, and you you can actually map out the the band structure in different locations and actually we have my uh, our postdoc Sadi Akihana wrote a fancy machine learning algorithm uh, to go through all the data and and identify uh, which to which of the two rotations uh, the different bits of the sample belong and so here's a nice map and now getting on to the uh, getting on to the physics, uh, just one other piece of housekeeping. These data are in fact consistent with synchrotron data near the gamma point. If you add up the the data from the different uh, from the different uh, uh, rotations, okay. So the synchrotron data is just sort of this circle. Uh, uh, if you then simply add the two uh, types of domains that we have. Uh, you get something which looks rather similar to the synchrotron data, but as Andre just pointed out, the resolution is much better. You can start to do physics with those streaks. So let's talk about the physics uh, you could do. So this shows, first of all, uh, the comparison uh, in detail with, with DFT. Uh, the DFT actually, this is a DFT calculation where we've done a little bit of averaging along the Z direction. Uh, simply because, of course, even here, there's still a finite escape depth for the electrons. Uh, but what you see here next to those data, uh, basically going from the M prime to the M point, is, is, is three major bands crossing the Fermi level, three major ones. And then, uh, amazingly, actually up here, there is a, a flat band, not far, uh, just, just, uh, just uh, about 20 or 30 millivolts above the Fermi level. And, and uh, so this actually, the DFT really replicates that structure with one big proviso, namely that, that there are three bands crossing the Fermi level, not two. 
So there seems there's a spare band that's come in into the data. That one, the beta band. It turns out that beta band is the sharpest one of the lot. And in fact, uh, uh, what I've been showing you here is is uh, is just cuts through the the actual data, uh, just showing you how sharp, in fact, that that uh, that uh, beta band uh, that beta band really is. And uh, what you're seeing here uh, at the at the uh, at the left is uh, two polarizations, and it turns out actually whether you see that band or not depends on the polarization, how you see that band, but. What's found is you get fairly sharp, what we call these alpha bands. Uh, but then uh, if you tune into this uh, vertical polarization, you actually get, uh, uh, you can actually see uh, what we call a gamma band, which is here. And on top of that, you see an extremely sharp beta band. And in fact, if you, if you just analyze the mean free path that you get from that, it's in excess of 100 angstroms, it's something like 150 angstroms, which is actually comparable to what you get uh, as a mean free path uh, from the uh, just the this very simple Druid analysis of the following resistance. This is this is around 20 Kelvin or 10, actually it's around four Kelvin. It's, it's down, yeah. It's a low temperature. The, the domain size the the domain the domain size is is just uh, measured in in uh, several is 20 microns. 20, yeah. So the the scale bar is, is 40 microns. So you just park you park actually the data that I'm showing most of the data were parked. Parts here. Yeah, yeah. Oops. Yeah. So depending on the polarization, so here, here you see basically you have to look at the contour plot. You see two things, and I'm just cutting very, very close to the Fermi edge here. And so what you see here is you do actually see two things as if this thing looks like a shoulder, but it's actually another peak. And then you see this extremely sharp object rising from that. Yeah, on the other side, you see alpha band is a fairly sharp peak, but not quite as sharp as this one. So beta is the sharpest one of the law. Yeah. Beta is also the one that makes the least amount of sense because uh, alpha and gamma just sort of exist everywhere beta just stops just just sits there okay so this is this is interesting uh actually uh just just uh, for the record and i'm not going to go through this since it's a, a little bit too detailed is these flat bands uh, uh somehow uh these these uh these i didn't mean these flat bands these the this small fermi surface looks relevant to, for other measurements for instance, for instance uh, the has van alphen uh, there's actually, for instance, you can calculate from our measurements, you can calculate the DHVA frequencies for this, uh, uh, for this small uh, gamma band, and actually get values which are, which, which are close to those actually in the literature, which were actually attributed to something completely different. They're attributed to, this, to the, these Dirac points, which uh, DFT shows are just not there. So uh, we have a feeling that we actually have resolved why uh, you do see this, the house and uh, uh, even though, uh, and, and it's just by a coincidence that whatever calculation was done for the de uh coincides with the, with the incorrect uh, band structure for the material. But this is, this is a, a detail. But the fact is these bands matter in the bulk. Okay. Now, there's another interesting thing about this this stuff. So we said that there are three bands when in fact I really expected only two based on the DFT. But if you warm up from six Kelvin or 70 Kelvin, that beta band just disappears. So the beta thing seems to be a, a low temperature a property of the low temperature state. Ah, <laughs> that's a, that's a, a synonymous. I'll talk about broadening now. Uh, of course, of course, it, it it could just be broadened out. That's, but but the but the fact is, you cannot identify it anymore. Yeah, yeah uh, let me let me now show you show you what 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 uh, what we what else we learn here. Uh, so we actually have plotted up here for you. I plotted the 
the delta, it, you know, the widths of these peaks, okay, which is of course just the inverse scattering length, as a function of the distance from the Fermi, uh, from the Fermi surface. And so you'll notice this is here in, in, uh, in inverse angstroms. Uh, delta K is also uh, in inverse angstroms. So that, that delta K there is a, is a half width. Uh, and uh, it turns out that, uh, and what I'm plotting for you here are the data sets where, uh, where I, uh, the different colors correspond either to different bands, beta band or alpha band, and different temperatures. So the hotter, uh, the alpha band, which we can still identify at 70 Kelvin is for instance here at the high temperature. And then at the low temperature at six Kelvin, it moves down to there. Uh, this is the beta band, which we can only resolve at the low temperature. And what's very interesting is these, these straight lines here correspond simply to the, the really silliest marginal Fermi liquid ansatz where you say, that uh, essentially this, this width here, this half width is, is precisely equal to, essentially the, the is, is precisely limited by the wavelength uh, of these uh, quasi particles as measured relative to the Fermi surface. That's a slope, that slope is exactly one. Okay, so that's a, a funny thing. So for, in other words, these things to cohere over a phase shift, which is, uh, precisely uh, defined by uh, the distance uh, uh, from the Fermi surface. Okay, so there's something uh, interesting going on here. And we suspect basically that there's some kind of strong correlation of physics here, uh, which, which may now come from the combined effects of an empty flat band, which we did not see. Uh, and then uh, perhaps U, which is quite sizable, 1.3 EV, and of course, let's not leave out uh, leave out spin orbit coupling. So the the, the physics uh, of generating this band here, this extra band, may be physics that we're all familiar with uh, from uh, other systems, including heavy fermion systems, where you could actually generate some kind of a, a sharp uh, quasi particle uh, resonance, uh, which is induced on account of partial immobilization of of, of carriers via hybridization with this flat band. Okay. So this is, uh, so we looked for a flat band. I don't think we found it. We did find it in DFT calculations. If you look in detail at the photo emission data, which we believe now is bulk and, and very well resolved, it, it seems that there's, a, there's actually an interesting many body physics effect, uh, which we ought to be uh, looking at. So just summarize, Arcus plus DFT, no flat bands, nor Dirac coins uh, in Arnton, as in simple calgamate, mono and bilayer calculations, but near the gamma point, strong correlation physics, perhaps connected with flat bands just above EF. The last two mi minutes, uh, let me just talk about the spin sector of this material. So we couldn't get anywhere uh, with the simple models uh, for this calgamate lattice when we looked at uh, uh, the electronic uh, spectrum in photo emission, the question is, do those simple models make any sense even for the spin sector rather than the quasi, the ordinary quasi particle sector? And, and here uh, I actually have to inform you that, that on the spin sector, things are amazingly simple. So we've done uh, uh, resonant elastic uh, X-ray uh, scattering measurements of the magnons here. And, and indeed, actually, we do find uh, a strong uh, optic mode, and that optic mode is uh, indeed uh, coming, uh, is, is, is uh, indeed what you uh, want uh, for this uh, dispersion uh, surface. Remember, I'm just uh, remember what I said at the beginning, uh, dispersion surface essentially for the Kagame thing has three parts to it. It has essentially the, what I expect for the honeycomb lattice for this Dirac points, plus a flat uh, uh, K independent thing uh, stuck on the top. Uh, and one can actually see that flat K independent thing. And uh, the data are extremely, uh, extremely simple, uh, much simpler than photo emission data are. Uh, life continues to be simple. There's actually only one coupling constant that we can identify. Uh, that coupling constant just comes from the nearest neighbor, uh, Heisenberg uh, Hamiltonian. It's 25 and a half uh, MeV. 
And actually that gives you, uh, even though now ignoring the two dimensionality, uh, a mean field uh, transition temperature for the material of 800 K, which you know is, is not terribly far from the 640 K that's been observed. So we have the simple life in the spin sector, rather complicated life uh, in, the, uh, in, in the quasi particle sector. Uh, so summarize, interesting flat band physics without, without highly localized orbitals or spins on the Kagame lattice. At first sight, iron to tin two looks like a great realization, but there's really no evidence for the flat electronic bands as one uh, uh, would have hoped from uh, the initial you know, jargon when type calculations. Uh, however, it's still worth thinking about this stuff because we've discovered this gamma point uh, centered small Fermi surface where there's uh, clearly uh, some strong interaction physics going on. And there is also DFT evidence for a small sort of flat band near that, uh, uh, near those parabolic bands that are defining those uh, small Fermi surface. Uh, at the same time, uh, at first sight, and I can give another talk about what happens on second sight, but at first sight, actually the spin waves look extremely simple. So let me just leave you with this. This stuff is both simple and complex, and I think it has some legs uh, left uh, for uh, people uh, like yourselves uh, to do some uh, theory on. Thanks a lot. Any other questions? Give about probably question about the second talk that you are going to give. Uh, if I you phrased uh, magnetic results in terms of spins, yeah, just spin Hamiltonian. If instead I will use fermionic language, metallic language, yeah, yeah. and takes point of view that you said that there are bands right. near the Fermi level and presumably flat band above. Right. If I take this and calculate particle hole bubbles and then from them calculate spin susceptibility. Right. Do you think did anyone for did anyone do this? No. And second, that probably flat band will have some effect on uh, S of Q and Omega. That tiny flat band now. Uh, I don't know it. Yeah. I mean, what I can tell you is, is, uh, is, is that this story on the spins is much more, when you start looking at the details of that, it's much more complicated than that. So the physics of the, uh, of this magnetic response function is the poles, of the magnetic response function are correctly given by the stupid theory with one parameter, but everything else, the real parts of the pole mm -hmm. are given, but everything else is completely different. But in general, this is a metal, right? So this, it's a good it's metal. It's, it's a, a metal. very good metal, and, and the life is extremely different. I mean, I can just maybe uh, give you a preview because uh, I skipped over those slides. Uh, uh, this shows. Uh, the uh, which you exp this is the uh, essentially the magnetic susceptibility as a function of Q and omega uh, uh, for the simple Kagame lattice. Now, of course, with Riggs, you only have access to the zone center, but the fact is that there's a, uh, a selection rule for for normal uh, uh, normal um, system uh, with uh, you know with localized uh, moments which says actually the optic mode should not be visible, for example, in the Q goes to zero limit. That selection rule is, is, hugely, is hugely violated in this stuff. And, and the other thing, of course, if you start looking at uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we've then of course done an analysis of these, these data, the eigenfrequencies, as I say, the real part of the eigenfrequencies is actually given correctly by the stupid theory, but, but the imaginary part is is uh, is much more interesting, and also the the uh, uh, the, amp the scattering amplitudes are not at all given by the, the do not obey the the normal extinction rules that you have for an insulator. So so things life is much more interesting there also.
Uh, you showed some uh, uh, polarization dependent data on RPS. Is it clear from that what orbitals are involved in the beta band that is puzzling? Um, well, yeah, from the polarizations, of course, you can tell that. But as I say, there's the, this beta band doesn't seem to show up in the in the band calculation. So, what orbital is it? Which orbital? It's, it is. It, it obviously has to be the same orbitals that you see in the gamma in the gamma band, and the gamma band. The gamma band we do know a lot about from the from the DFT because it does show up in the DFT images. That one does show up in the DFT. So the the, the, the I mean, our hypothesis is basically that the that the beta band is derived from a hybridization of the gamma band. You see it's it's out there, hybridization of the gamma band and the flat band. And then the, the alpha band, for some strange reason, doesn't really hybridize, and maybe for some symmetry reason with that, with that flat band above it. But this at this point, this this is just conjecture, and one should be able to, you know, one needs to uh, go and ask very detailed questions of the DFT calculation, which we have not yet asked. You mentioned something about marginal thermal liquid telling that delta k precisely equals to k minus kf. So I just wanted to, if you don't mind, what is delta k? Delta k is the half width. Delta k is the half width of a Lorentzian that's used to fit the data. I see. Okay. So it's Lorentzian fit and it's it Lorentzian fits. fits. And it fits. Yeah, those are these fits. These these are the these are this these are the fits here that are shown. Uh -huh. these okay, are. right. And the half width of this thing is Exactly this thing. It's exactly that, and so it's it, uh, but, but what that means is it's if you have a confining, you know, it, it, it's as if, as if you said that that uh, it, it's it's a funny coincidence. It may just be a coincidence, but basically, if you if you say I have to I have to fit, uh, you know, one oscillation. Right, of yeah. a quasi particle within within that mean free path. It's a exactly it's yeah, a numerological thing. I, I'm not yeah. sure. Just surprised to know that Lorentzian fit, fits it all. Okay. Quasi particles yeah, with some lifetime. But it's a half width isn't doesn't it doesn't depend on whether I'm telling you about a Lorentzian or a Gaussian, right? Yeah, but then it's exactly. Yeah, but it is, it does, you know, the way these things have tails on them. So, so you certainly need, you know, these, these, there's a, there are tails on these things. And so, you, and there's asymmetries. Yeah. Okay. I don't see other questions. So let's thank the speaker again. So the point is basically that those beta bands are generated dynamically at low temperature. And, and this is an exercise for the theorists to validate or refute that claim. <laughs>